Ho ho ho, Merry Christmas. How are you? I am 16 Leo, and what is the first thing that you think of when you hear the word Christmas? Balls, balls. That is right. And what about the second thing, the actual thing? Oh. Santa! <laughs> no witnesses? Exactly. Let's make Christmas horror movies. Because when I think about the festive period and being around my family and the people I love, the first thing I think of is where's the axe? Who can I decapitate? Really? Which uncle can I give the smackdown to? <laughs> I don't know, is it just a me thing? Or does everybody here like horror movies for Christmas? Because my favorite Christmas movies are like Home Alone and I'll Be Home for Christmas. Movies that embody family and love and happiness. It's the one time that I think everybody accepts, no matter how happy or sad they are, this is a great period for everyone to just be festive and happy. I don't usually think about murdering people during Christmas, but lo and behold, there is a fascination with this, and somehow, holiday Christmas horror movies have been made. In fact, one in particular that I found today called Holiday Hell is what we're looking at. And it might be the worst, bar none, Christmas slash holiday movie I've ever seen. In fact, it's not even one movie. It's five movies combined into one. Am I blowing your balls right now? <laughs> Am I? I mean, jingle my balls. There's five different movies all wrapped into one. It's an anthology. It's like Black Mirror. And boy, do I wish I had a Black Mirror or a black screen. I wish my screen was broken so I couldn't watch it. But I had to. I sat through this crap twice. One to watch it and the second time to like waffle it down because you do not want to watch an hour, 30 minutes of this crap. But you're going to have to watch me watch this crap. So settle down, grab some cookies and milk. This is going to be a wild adventure. While you're at it, if you'd like to subscribe and uh, give me the gift of being part of the channel, I would love that. And if you don't want to subscribe, then I hope you get Cole. J. Cole for Christmas. What's up? Also hit me up at 16leo underscore on my Instagram if you want to wish me a Merry Krima. I would really like a Merry Krima wish, so that would be great. But first, a quick word about today's sponsor, Bosley's. I don't know about you, but growing up, I used to see Bosley's ads on TVs all the time. They were like the OGs of hair restoration. In fact, they're America's number one hair restoration experts. Bosley's offers many solutions, from one-day surgical procedures to low-level laser therapy, or FDA-approved medication that help you keep the hair you have and help it grow thicker. There are options for every single stage of hair loss. Millions of men and women have come to Bosley's for the answers to their hair loss and hair restoration questions. So it's safe to say they have the most experience in this area and are well-trusted by many. With over 70 locations across the US and the option for home delivery, as well as free in-person and video consultations, it's never been easier to combat hair loss. Hair loss is extremely common and nothing to be ashamed of. So if you want to start preventing hair loss, doing it early is the key. Right now, Bosley's is giving away a free information kit and a $250 gift card towards a procedure. Learn how easy it can be to get your hair back. Check out the link in my description for your free Bosley's info kit and $250 card. Thanks, Bosley's. Brace your eye holes. Okay, so already, the title of this movie, Holiday Hell, I thought it was a Christmas movie because on Amazon Prime they advertised it as a Christmas movie, but it is not technically just a Christmas movie, it's a holiday hell movie. They incorporate other holidays such as Hanukkah, regular day in New York, happy Hanukkah, and Valentine's Day, the holiday of stuff. But anyway, this movie is that light of a Christmas movie and you can see by the title they've put zero effort into this. So the movie starts off as the main character whose name I cannot remember to save my life. She decides to go to a shop called Never Told Casket Company. Hello? Is anyone here? Good evening. I wasn't expecting any more customers tonight. Bitch, why'd you leave the door open then? Why'd you close the door if you weren't expecting customers? This is like having a Starbucks and someone walks in and orders a coffee and someone's like, surprise Pikachu face. Like, what? A coffee? What are you, stupid? Look closed. It's Sunday at 2 p.m. What the hell is wrong with you? So anyway, she goes into the store and she finds a dude. He decides to tell her stories about different items in that store and that sets off the different stories. All of the objects in this shop have a story behind them. If they don't have a story, I will not sell them. Which is why I call my shop Never Told. All the objects in here have a story that's never been
I know what you're thinking. How the fuck does the guy know whether to buy them or not if it's never been told? This is the logic we're going with. It's never been told except to him, I guess. He knows all the stories, so someone had to tell it to him. This movie just started and I, I hate, I hate this. I hate this. Have a look around. What's the story with that mask? Well, the mask, you have a good eye. <laughs> I like how she looks at the mask and she's like, what about that mask? And he looks at it and he's like, good eye. It's right there, bro. Stevie Wonder could see that shit on the wall. Honestly, dude. Ugh. Okay, anyway. So the lady points out a mask and says, what is the story behind that? And this sets off a chain of events where the man tells a story about what happened behind the mask and how it came to be in his store. This mask was retrieved in the ashes of a fire, a house fire. Did anyone die? You should just arrest that lady for saying it like that. Did anyone die? How many people? Let's <laughs> say it slower. Like, what the f- You should leave the store. Oh my god, you should have known something was up with this lady as soon as she came in with a velvet red overcoat at like 11.20 trying to buy a present for her sister for the next day. That's just trouble. But anyway, the guy doesn't even care about that. He's like, yeah, people die all the time. Oh yes, several people. And starts to explain the story. What do you mean? Well, this mask belonged to a very strange little girl. Story one, the mask. Story one starts off with a group of teenagers going towards an abandoned house that is said to have been previously owned by some people who owned a mosque and was pretty scary. That's all I know about it. Here we are, girls. We call it the Inferno, because things get a little hot. That's my favorite actor in the whole everything. This, this is like Denzel Washington if he just if he didn't know how to act. It's just a normal human who they decided, can you act? And he said, nope. And I said, well, you're doing it anyway. This is it, ladies. They call it the inferno because things get heated. Flames. Shut up, John. God, you're so stupid. Come on, girl. China and Julie already know I'm gonna heat up your panties tonight. Asshole. Come on, Mira. I'm just playing, girl. I'm just playing, girl. Come on, let me heat up your panties tonight. Uh, come on, girl. Come on, girl. I don't know who he is, and I don't know what he acts in, but I would love to see him in more stuff. So each film, I think, represents a part of different film culture. This film, to me, is the slasher genre, and I'm gonna get a little cinephile on you. You know, films like Psycho, Friday the 13th, Halloween, things that feature young people getting uh, offed one by one. This is what this genre of film is. When we're talking about like film, Scream is probably one of the best, if not the best slasher movie in a long time. Each characters have these separate different character traits that either get them to survive or get them to die. Like usually the virgin in the movie loves. That's how all slasher movies go. Sydney, who's the main character, loves because she has not done it yet. And that was just oh, the way that they did things. Also, historically speaking, the black character dies first. I don't know why, but it happens. Somehow the black people die first. That's every movie. Oh my god, you were so right. That mascara totally gave me the confidence I needed to tell him it was over. I told you, babe. You just gotta get those lashes plumped and you feel like the baddest fish in town. Whoever wrote this dialogue deserves a raise to a ceiling. I mean, come on. You're, girl, just get your lashes done and you'll be the baddest bitch in town. You'll be so cool. Was that needed? Was this necessary? Do we need to know that they're airhead blondes? Can you not do this without like spoon feeding it to the audience? The thing I hate about horrible movies is that in a lot of cases, they spoon feed you everything. They had to make them not only literally blonde, but stupid as well. I'd be surprised if they even knew a bad guy was there. Anyway, the main characters walk into the house that seems to be already lit up with what looks like either light bulbs or like blender hybrids. Not sure. There is also a chandelier <laughs> and there seems to be electricity in the house, so I don't know why they didn't turn the lights on, but hey, that's just me. Didn't Paul tell you? This place belonged to Ken and Barb Dahl. It's been sitting empty for years since the murder. Thank you for the exposition. She was talking to no one as well. Didn't didn't Paul tell you? This would belong to Ken and Barbie. And because of the murders in the house, nobody has lived here. Okay. Thanks. I was just saying that to everyone. Thank you for the exposition. I that's a really clunky way of doing it, but sure. Also, Ken and Barbie, really? Ugh. The bitch went and chopped off her husband and son on Valentine's Day. 
total psycho. The daughters went crazy, got sent to some nut house after that. The daughters went crazy, got sent to some sort of nut house after that. Cut. Cut, what are you doing, Rick? Oh, I'm not supposed to say cut. You, I'm sorry, my bad. I'm, hey, I'm just the actor. Are you drunk? What good acting from this man. Please say more lines. This is a little anniversary party. This is a dramatic pause. Little anniversary party. Cut. Oh, damn, I did it again. I'm so sorry. But I'm a good actor, right? Okay, Rick. Well, you know what, man? You're fucking fired. He sounds like an NPC. He sounds like something you have to press X with, and then the dialogue skips. Hey, I was looking for you, and friendship is what I see. Do you want to do the mission? Not that much. Okay, bye. Have a good time. She just sounds like a computer man. The house technically still belongs to the girls, but you know, they're still locked up. Did they have one roll of camera film and just decide to use this? This is what he does. They're locked up. I don't know what to do. I don't understand why this movie was made like this, where there's so much exposition and they couldn't actually show us what's happened. If it's a short story, you gotta write something really succinct and show people. Don't have like a hundred lines of dialogue that just explain shit. I don't even know anything about this. I don't even know half of the characters' names. This is really horrible shoddy filmmaking. Mama doll must have been a pain freak. She cut her own jugular at the end. Ew, gross. Bullshit. I wouldn't shit ya. You're my favorite, turd. You guys were always so mean to those girls. <laughs> Me? How about you? <laughs> Me? And how about you? Oscar winner. Mike. Mike Aton. Right there. And the Oscar goes to... Mike Mikeaton. <laughs> Me? How about you? Uh, Mike Mikeaton over there <laughs> decides to have a weird dialogue. Then he leaves to get to another room so he can get frisky with his girlfriend. The other characters, the two blondes, don't say much. And I assume the lead character is the one who is a mute or uh, uh, deaf. She does sign language. I'm not sure why she does sign language. I'm not sure what her backstory is. She also has a scar. I'm not sure if you've seen that. That's very big and noticeable. Nobody really says anything about that either. So I would love some explanation, but hey, it's your movie. I'm just watching it. Got a little mood lighting going on. Who lived up here? It looks like a little girl's room. This looks like a little girl's room, does it? You think little girls have like what looks like subpoenas hanging from her wall there and a little closet on the other side what looks like, you know, old man clothing? I would like to know what makes you think this is a little girl's room. Is it the white walls or the, you know, the essays on the wall? It looks more like a fucking John Doe from Seven's room. I'll just look around. Bro, at least read it if you get this man is so dumb. If there's no pictures there, he's like, God, what the is that? That's hieroglyphics. I can't read that. I don't know. He didn't even try to read any of the stuff there. Maybe that's vital information. Also, how the hell do you not know what this is? You clearly earlier said you've been partying for weeks here. You didn't go to this room. It took you weeks to enter another room. Well, are you so nice that you break into a house and only stay in the living room waiting for someone to be like, Oh, do you want to come up to the bedroom? Then they do a little jump scare where he recognizes the mask and he, he touches it like on the chin. I don't know why. And she opens her eyes and just goes straight to black. And we can assume that Mikey Mike is dead now. Damn. First character gone. The best one. So, Julie. You finally going to get popped tonight? Maybe that's what you need. Some good D to help you hit the high notes. <laughs> what kind of friendship is this, just by the way? You got two blondes who seem to hate everyone else. Then you got a boyfriend and girlfriend who are black but don't actually seem to fit in with the others. Then you got a mute and some other girl who just seems to want anarchy in the room. But also, the black friend hates the mute friend. I, I don't know, I'm not sure which friend would be like, yeah, maybe you, maybe you need some dick so you can hit the high note. She's, she's 
fucking deaf. She can't speak. You are so insensitive for saying that. She's also got a big scar on her face. Like Zoro stabbed her in the neck. Like, can, can someone tell me what happened with her neck? Anyway, after insulting the mute, the girl goes back into the room. I don't know what happened to Mikey Mike. He must have got moved because she can't see him anywhere. She decides to go in and the door closes. The other character then dies after being stabbed by a broken leg of a Barbie doll. I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. Give me your neck and I will stab it. The classic song goes. But anyway, I don't know if you saw the blood there. That girl is made out of 90% water because that was very watery blood. Yes. The girl dies, now we are left with four characters. The next thing that happens is the two blondes go down to the basement and start drinking, and then one oddly gets turned on and kisses the other one. Why? I don't know. OMFG! You Can't say that word over here. Nope. She said a word that rhymed with Ike. <laughs> Why was that even in the movie? Why was this necessary? I'm not sure. I can tell you right now, this plays absolutely zero part in the movie whatsoever. It has no bearing on the outcome of the movie. So why the scene was in the movie is beyond me unless the director just wanted two girls to kiss, in which case you sir should be fired. Another sort of jump scare happens where the mute girl starts walking down the stairs and while she walks down the stairs from behind her, people are kissing and they break into the door kissing. So that was the jump scare. Oh. Paul and Kenny are here. Howdy, Julie. Paul and Kenny are here. Howdy, Julie. I'm from the south of Texas, Julie. That's where I came from. She said, she said there was gonna be a party here. I said, okay, and I brought my friend. Oh, he's over here too, just looking really weird while we're kissing. He, I don't know why he looks like that, but you get sloppy sack. If you have any objections, say something. Oh wait, you're mute. Everybody's mean to you in the movie. I just, I thought I'd be too mean too. Long I've wanted you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know you gotta be knee high. To oh, oh, <laughs> oh, Hey, man, this is a Christmas movie. What, the, what, what are we doing here, bro? Hey, stop that. You better stop that. You, you know what happened. He was like, get down low, and then he was like, Ooh, no, 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 no. That was his ding dong. She was, she was sucking on his ding dong. Man. This is a Christmas movie, guys. Is this movie called Jingle Balls or Jingle My Balls? Is this movie called Suck My Candy Cane? What's happening? Why we, why is this necessary in a movie, huh? We needed this scene, did we? And while she's doing that, this happens. Yee-haw! That's what every cowboy says once he gets the suck. You gotta try it. Yee-haw! It's just, it's like conducive to where you are. Like if you're Indian, you just scream out, I'll give you a discount! Like, <laughs> I don't know. How, how stereotypical can you get in a situation like this? What a weird line to say. Anyway, while giving the suck, uh, the main character realizes that boyfriend that she was giving it to actually gets decapitated by, by the bobby doll then she turns around and the screen just goes black we're left wondering oh did she die too i guess we'll have to find out right now hey <laughs> come on julie I, I thought you were here for me i just trying to be spontaneous you know just trying to get the milk too that was a good slap she gave him a just a that was pretty good. <laughs> anyway, Paul, whose name I somehow remember, after getting slapped, decides to find sex elsewhere and sees a cute little fine thing that he hasn't seen in the house before and decides to hit on it. He doesn't know that it's actually the killer. Uh, she then kills him because, I guess, because she's just killing everyone in the house now. The mute sees this and screams. That wasn't a joke. She really did it. She went... Is this a comedy? What is what is going on? Then she runs to get help, but she realizes she can't talk. The girl actually sees her, and then they have like a vicious fight. By vicious, I mean horrible. The main character then somehow finds a pole to stick through her, and then walks it off because she's a, she's a damn tough person. She's like Leonardo DiCaprio from The Revenant, just takes every beating. She also beats the villain to death with a chain, and she does a pretty- she does- she does a lot of shots. Why did you kill my sister? A shocking twist. 
Is it not? That was the skull sister. I'm not sure what this is, but apparently this was her sister and she's been leading people into the house to try and get them killed. That's what she's been doing. So, you know, I have questions like, why were you sucking a guy off who you were going to kill? <laughs> why did you try and kill your mute best friend if you didn't want her to die? I have so many questions. We only wanted those who tortured us. Even after I took care of our parents, we were treated like rats in that madhouse. <laughs> now, now, Dolly, don't listen to those kids. You'll always be pretty. We finally escaped. New names, but old scars. So then a flashback scene happens, sort of like an origin story, but it happened too late, which I'm not, I'm really not sure. I want to punch someone. Why'd you have to kill my sister? My pretty sister. The movie ends with the bad guy winning, which I would say is revolutionary if the movie wasn't so shit. So this goes beyond all slasher films. In a normal slasher film, the good guy wins. The good guy is usually the virgin or the person who is the most innocent. They then save the lives and go back to a place of reconciliation and a new beginning. However, in this movie, it ends with the bad guy winning. So apparently the house burned down and everyone burned down with it. And the house burned down to the ground soon after that. Besides that, that segment is really horrible. If I had to compare it to films, I would compare it to the early slasher films, which really made a point of scaring you. And it really lulled you into a false sense of security, which I loved about slasher films. This did none of that. I'm sorry, we haven't been properly introduced. My name is Rosemont Thaddeus Rosemont. Amelia. See, look, okay, again, in terms of like filmmaking, we're down one story and now we're introducing the characters. Why didn't you do that at the start when the guy said hello? If someone was actually reviewing this movie, they'd have to wait fucking one story in to be like, oh, that's Thaddeus and that's Amelia. I didn't know that. Bro, I was gonna call him Jeff and her Jeff hat. Anyway, Thaddeus looks at Amelia and is like, have we met somewhere? You look really familiar. And she says no. Initially, I thought he was just being a creepy old man, but this actually plays into the story later but you're gonna have to watch to find out please if you've fallen asleep get up I'm, i cannot be the only one watching this shortly after they move into story two That's when amelia doll. looks at another like heirloom that? which looks like a Chuck E. cheese doll fucked a rabbi story two the second story is about hanukkah and has a jewish back story to it it's about a rabbi that comes to life and protects a kid. It's sort of like the more Jewish version of E.T. I guess. I don't... It starts off with the Hanukkah tradition, the little son being left alone by his parents. Happy Hanukkah, Kevin. Happy Hanukkah, son. Very old. It was made by a rabbi a long time ago. He'll keep you company while we're away on our business trip. <sighs> Does this remind you of a movie? What else could we be forgetting? That's right, Home Alone. Kevin! Right? Kevin is the kid's name in this movie. Kevin McAllister is the name of the child in Home Alone. So I feel like they're really on the nose with this one. I really do. Just keep watching. A babysitter comes in to babysit and is left in their house. And she turns out to be a criminal who wants to steal their shit and sell it for money. Okay, hey, we're out of here. Okay, you call if you need anything. I will. Kevin? Oh, brat. Kevin run like an old grandpa, bro. <laughs> You're eight years old. You can't run wonky like that. Oh my God, bro. Ask the rabbi to fix your legs. <laughs> You got tired after running too. Heavily panting and shit. You ran up the stairs, bro. Kevin then spies on his nanny. The babysitter calls her then boyfriend, who happens to be my second favorite character in the movie. And you're gonna see why. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I hear you. I just ain't trying to roll out there that soon, you know? Yes! 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 He's, he's white. This looks like an extra from 8 Mile, bro. What the fuck are you doing wearing a bandana and then a cap turned sideways with some sweatband? Do you come from the gym? This movie was made a few years ago. Nobody dresses like that now. If you dress like that and went to the hood, you get shot easy. Easy, bro. Just lay out your grave. 
Well, find a way to get here quick because we're running out of fucking time. Excuse me? Who the fuck do you think you're talking to like that, huh? I ain't even about to hear this shit right now. <laughs> I don't know if they gave him lines. I don't know if they were just like, yeah, act black. And like the actor was like, you No, know, when they gave me this part, they said, act urban. They, they said, act suburban. I was like, I don't, I don't, I've never been to the hood. And they said, go act like shy town. I was like, what is that? Oh, man. I've had to act many things in my life. Black was not one of them until now. I've been babysitting this little every weekend for three months just so we can do this. All right, this family is loaded. What I really want to know is how this backstory started. How'd you get involved with the real Slim Shady? What, did you see him at a rap contest? He was like, Dogs are cool, you're a mule. And if you don't like it, then bitch, you're a fool. Like, is that, that's all? And you're like, he has my heart, but now also spread my legs. I would love to know that backstory. That's my favorite dynamic here. A babysitter and a lowly rapper <laughs> try and rob a house. It's a great story. Why is this not the main thing? Please. Discuss. They have all their valuables stashed in a secret room downstairs. And I have the key, okay? Okay, now I was looking at his face like, what is this acting, really? Because he's like, Yo. Serve you cocktails on the beach. Yo. Yo. But it turns out something was happening behind the scenes. Yo, you there? Yo, baby, what was that? Baby? Who the fuck you calling baby? Oh, shut the fuck up. There it is. We went two for two. Two different segments, two different BJs. That's the running theme in every different series. Give someone a BJ. Lo <laughs> love it. Oh, wow. Unnecessary. Very unnecessary. Also, in the plot, the girl sees Kevin spying at her and is like, What are you doing? She walked up the stairs talking about this. Could she not be downstairs where Kevin can't hear her? Could she not text this dude instead of calling him? She knows that Kevin's there. Why are you speaking on the phone about it? You're just waiting for your plan to be foiled. It's as if you knew that a rabbi was gonna come to life and wreck you. Open the door, you little brat! Turns out Kevin is a weak bitch and can't actually hold the door down, and that's his fault. But anyway, she breaks in. You were gonna spy on me, huh? Planning on calling mommy and daddy too? I have worked long and hard for this. I've earned this. And if you think I'm gonna let a little shit like you stand in the way of that, I like the acting. I like how she grabs his arm and just like, just tussles it. You little shit! And he's like, oh, oh, what the? I love that acting. It's not even the actor's fault. Honestly, it's the directors who are like, yeah, just grab his arm. And then what do I do? Shake it? Is that, am I supposed to intimidate him? Yep. That's not gonna be very intimidating. Just do it, just do it. Oh, Kevin, you dick! Kevin, you're never gonna call your family! Ah. That's, that's it. You're dead wrong, you hear me? I, I you, you- There, there it is. I, 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 I. Kevin, Kevin, just, come here, come here. Just say I. I! Not like that, you dumbass. Say I, like, many times. I, I, I! <laughs> Fucking hell. Like, like someone's- Like someone took your toy. Like someone took your sex toy, to Kevin. I, 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 I. That's the one. The babysitter then I tells Kevin that he's doll. stupid and his baby doll is stupid. And then she goes outside and closes the door and locks it from the outside. Oh, shit. This man got locked in. This is easily the funniest part in the movie when Kevin tries to open the door and realizes he cannot. <gasps> the lock is right there, Kevin. <laughs> can see it. Bro, it's above the doorknob. Kevin has learned a lot in his life. His young, beautiful life. He's a very smart man. Kevin is learning, like everyone in this world. But one thing he forgot is how to open a fucking door, bro. He, really, Kevin, you're gonna starve to death. But anyway, Kevin's stuck inside his house now that he got locked out of his room. <laughs> I'm sorry, locked into his room. Baby, you there? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 I'm here. I took care of it. There's the line. There's, there's my favorite. Baby, you there? Yeah, 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 no, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, nah, 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 nah. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, 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 nah. Yeah. Nah, nah, nah. Yeah, I'm here. Anyway, the boyfriend drops off that hooker. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say. She drops her off and she says, uh, I hope you die, which is probably the smartest foreshadowing ironic line in the film. 
That's the only line I'll give even a semblance of credit to. But then he says my favorite other line, PEACE BITCH! And then leaves. I, I don't know why they needed to find a white suburban thug. I'm really not sure why this movie couldn't even like comprehend. Maybe we could have interracial dating. You know, maybe we could get a black guy instead of a white man who seems almost stereotypically horrible. <laughs> but anyway, he's on his way to come help rob the place. And then Kevin decides to bring his little doll to life. Why can't you help me? Ow! Ow! Rise of my will with all your might. Anyway, the Hebro over there, which I'm gonna call him instead of a Hebrew he bro, he's a Hebro. His like claim to fame is that he can move his head up and down. So when Kevin asks yes or no questions, he's like, yup or nope. Kevin's like, are you my friend? Will you exact revenge on this bitch? And the rabbi is like, hell yes, I will. So it's sort of like E.T. if E.T. was a uh, revenge-driven, alcoholic-fueled mess of a human. So like E.T. basically. Jackpot! <laughs> this lady got scared by a jump scare, which is a non-diegetic sound effect. Little film term, diegetic music, is music within the context of the movie. So if a character is hearing music within the movie, like from a radio within the movie, that's diegetic, non-diegetic is stuff like the background music, a cinema score, when they have the orchestras playing, unless that's really in the movie, that's non-diegetic. So she got scared by a sound effect that only the audience watching the movie should hear, which is mind-blowing. At least stupid. But yeah, carry on. Do you think I'm afraid to hurt you? You've got another thing coming, you hear me? You think I've never a kid before? I've cut kids. Naughty. Naughty. Naughty, naughty, naughty. What the hell is wrong with you? I've cut so much. I will take great joy in, in cutting your head off. Roar! Home Alone could never. They have Joe Pesci in Home Alone. I don't know if you know, Joe Pesci might be one of my favorite actors of all time. He played a guy in Goodfellas that was the craziest dude. Even that dude never shot or said he would cut a kid. She's out here like, I will. I will draw a Z on your face. Z Z Z Zorro. Damn, who says that? What a crazy lady. <laughs> Are you in there, you little creep? <laughs> she can't open the door. She's the one who closed it. When she locked the door, Kevin couldn't leave. Now when she's trying to get in, she can't get in. I just never seen a door that locks both ways. Like this movie is so tragic. It just wants to do whatever it wants. Like whenever it needs to do something convenient, it's like, yep, that's what we're doing. Anyway, the babysitter realizes the door is open. She goes towards it, finds nothing, but then is greeted by a tap on the back, to which she turns and mistakenly shoves her knife into the neck of her boyfriend, whose name is Trey. I didn't know it. I thought his name was Whiter Eminem. He then proceeds to die, which is a very sad moment. I, I felt some pain until I saw Kevin laugh like a megalomaniac. <laughs> I don't know who to root for in this movie. Kevin's so happy to see a man get stabbed in the neck. The babysitter's like, I'm gonna get you for this, even though she did it. She somehow gets up the stairs. I'm pretty sure she was down the stairs. The rabbi follows her up the stairs and then cuts one of her shins, which hurts her so badly that she moves backwards onto the stairs, tumbles down, and breaks every bone in her body, even though she was at the bottom of the staircase. Sorry, I just need a moment for uh, the brain aneurysm I just had. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. Um, yeah, Kevin sees this and he's pretty happy. Then he holds the doll and is like, yeah, I killed two people. It's sort of like Home Alone if Kevin McAllister murdered the two people and then got away with it. Anyway, uh, he asks the rabbi to clean the mess up and the rabbi does it. And then the next day, the parents get home and Kevin's like, oh, I miss you guys so much. He runs in and gives his dad a super heavy hug, even though his dad hired the people that almost killed Kevin. But anyway, they ask where the hell the babysitter is and he's like, ah, oh, she was with her boyfriend. And now, I don't know, they just ran off. Leaving Kevin to get away with all the crimes scot-free and his rabbi to just go on a debaucherous killing spree without anyone having any problem with this. That is how the episode ends.
Now, I don't want to make this a thing about culture or religion, but what is this saying about rabbis at this point? You have a murderous rabbi. Is this how you want to represent that religion? What was the point of making him a rabbi? I don't get it. Why didn't you make him like Chucky or like anything else? That's the parallel that I draw with this movie. It's sort of like Home Alone, it's sort of like Chucky, it has a little bit of E.T. in it. It's about a friendship between a guy and a, an object, sort of like E.T. It's a killing doll, so it's sort of like Chucky, and uh, the guy's Home Alone, he's also Kevin, and he's fighting two people off who are trying to invade his home. I would give this segment a 1 out of 10. It's really stupid, and I can find almost no fun in it, except the door that locks both ways, and the dude who plays Whiter Eminem. The third story is the first Christmas story in the Holiday Hell anthology, and it's probably the most well-acted one. The guy acting in it, I looked at and I was like, this is a familiar face, and I couldn't put my finger on it for the longest time. So after the movie, I looked at the cast, and his name was something Murray, and I was like, hmm, you know who he looks like? Bull Murray's, like, brother. Turns out he is Bull Murray's brother. This is a Bull Murray descendant actor, so the only semblance of good acting comes from that, which I can believe. But let's watch. The movie starts off with a suburban man and woman who are in a marriage that seems to be faltering. The man cannot seem to get a promotion at his well, job, and things are going really bad during the holidays. How was work? Tom got the promotion. What? Yeah. Can I just say something? The music really undercuts the whole scene that's going on. It undercuts the narrative of this. This dude has lost his job and is in a loveless marriage. And the music's like, doo, 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 You are in a loveless marriage and you can't get it up. Can you play some like actual music that actually fits the mood, please? So then the man tries to, you know, tries to get it on with his wife. And she's like, ugh. Get off me, you, you whale, you big sperm whale. And he's like, oh, oh, what the hell? What is wrong? Is it my weight? Is it the way that I look? Is it everything else? And she's like, yes, yeah, because you're fat, bro. Which is really mean off the wife. She's a very mean character in this. So then Chris actually gets uh, annoyed and decides to sleep on the couch because his wife isn't giving up that putang. For the first time, I actually sort of like the main character. In the first two anthologies, I hated all of the characters. This is the first film where I actually am like, oh, all he was doing was his job. But it's, it won't be for long. I'm gonna hate him soon enough. Chris is woken up by his daughter who says you're gonna be late for work and then he goes to work to find uh, a boss who is pretty belittling of him and a workmate who gets the promotion over him. And Tom, he's got something that really represents what this company's about. He's a go-getter. Hey, Chris, uh, no hard feelings, right? No, I'm fine. Congrats. My pride might hold a grudge. This man looking at a photo of a fish, adjusting his hair and face? Naughty. Stupid naughty. Stupid, stupid, stupid. What is wrong with you? That's a picture of a fucking fish. Also, what the hell does a company have a picture of a fucking fish for? What kind of synergy is that? Look at this fish. Look at this fish. It has scales. We need to upscale. What is this? Anywho, Chris is pretty sad that someone else gets the promotion over him, but they ask him to play Santa at the local Christmas party that they have every time. But it's not just a Christmas party, it's an XXXmas party, because this is a workplace that encourages affairs and sexual activity. I've never seen a company so mismanaged. Chris looks and he sees his wife flirting with someone else, the guy who got the promotion, and I think this is a decent piece of filmmaking. It shows Chris looking at something without telling the audience what exactly he's looking at, but he looks at his wife, uh, who is seemingly a lot more happy with this other guy, and wonders why he's not making her as happy, and I think it's a good scene. He's then interrupted by a chick who sits on his lap and tries to get a little too flirtatious with him. I don't know what it is about Santa suits that makes women want to sit in your lap, but I need to get one. So Chris then w walks uh, towards a room, he hears loud noises, and finds his wife having an affair with the person who got the promotion. But it's a pretty funny scene because he's like, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Ah! Ah! Ow, it's a good one. It's a good, it's a good owl. It's a good owl, yeah. It is a good owl! <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty funny. I'll, I'll give them a little bit of credit for that one. <laughs> Seeing his wife have an affair makes Chris really sad, and he goes to the bar where drinks till his heart's content. Double whiskey, neat. Ah, 
oh my god that's not a double that's a quintuple or something bro <laughs> you fooled your glass <laughs> that's not a double and you also drank that like it was apple juice Slow down. Uh, Chris is revealed to be a sober person for the most part, and he's actually been sober for over a year. So he's been trying to be on the wagon, which is another little character development, which I think is pretty good. Provides a little bit of insight to his backstory, and it helps develop the character so we can empathize or sympathize with him a little more. Chris then drinks too much, then sees his wife having the affair with the other guy in his head. <laughs> and this prompts him to get a little more aggressive and maybe drink more. Chris then gets so sourced that he talks to a guy in a bar, has a little fun, and then gets annoyed at him very soon after, prompting him to get thrown out of the bar. Fuck you in Cleveland! Hey, yeah! Hey! What? We're done. You're out. He then <clears throat> proceeds <clears throat> to <clears throat> piss on the bar. <laughs> hey, Christmas cocksucker! Oh, God, God damn, damn it! Christmas! Baller! Yeah, no, <laughs> Have you ever seen Santa puss on you? That sounds like an R. Kelly thing to do. Wow. You wanna piss in my bar? I'll give you something she to do. loved his cock inside her. What the hell narration was that? She didn't. She did not. What's wrong with you? She did not. Dead. Chris then takes the bat from the guy and actually uh, beats him with it and then starts going on his Santa rampage. Are you just gonna let them run over you like that, big man? Or are you gonna do something about it? You're nothing but a two-pump chump. Look, I, I don't want to point any more holes out in this movie, but if someone comes in a Santa suit to a hardware store and asks for a couple knives, razor blades, a machete, and other devices, would you not have a little concern? And if you could, you know, you could smell the alcohol so deeply on his breath that you got secondhand drunk just when he talked to you, I, I would hold off on selling him these appliances that he asked for. Anyway, Chris goes to exact revenge back on his party, and then he interrupts his boss actually doing some workplace negligence of his own, because the boss is trying to get one of the secretaries to um, give him a BJ. They're, they're trying to go three for three in this movie, but this doesn't happen. That isn't appropriate office behavior, sir! Whoa, 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 before you start stabbing people, can you see that background? Why is there another fish on the wall? What the fuck is it with you guys and fish? Stupid, stupid movie. Someone clearly had fish on their mind. Chris comes out from nowhere, like Chris Kringle over here. Nobody seems to have seen him walk in the room. The secretary was facing that way, but somehow didn't see him. But he peers in and he's like, <laughs> that is inappropriate behavior! and starts uh, hacking at people. He cuts off uh, the boss man's arm and also stars the secretary to death, which is honestly, what a throw. He just, he was like, Shh. That's no way to get ahead in this company. Hey -o. That's That wasn't bad. That wasn't, I love the one-liners. I love it, Chris. When you're drunk enough, I like the one-liners. Did I make the cut? You know, there seems to be a little disconnect between the two of us, huh? <laughs> this dude's arm is cut off and he's like, Oh! That one pained! The arm, right? No, no, that pun was really bad. Oh my god, stop! No way to get ahead. Oh, god, you're killing me with these puns, bro! Some sort of problem. You know, maybe if we could jab a little heart to heart, we could cut right to the meat of the matter, huh? No! Oh, cut to the meat! What the hell? Come on, bro! Could you, could you get the fish off the wall? Could you just, could you put the fish in a fish tank? Just leave it alone, bro. Stole my job. No, 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 Chris, Chris. You had my wife. Chris, take it easy, Chris. I feel like I'm getting fucked with no lube today, Tom. Easily, that's the best line in the whole film. <laughs> anyway, he also finds the guy who's been nailing his wife and, you know, very cleverly takes out a nail gun to nail his balls. And what I love about that scene is that there's no variation in the no. No, 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 no. You nailed my wife. I think I better nail you, huh? Oh my god, no! <laughs> really funny that his nuts are getting like absolutely wrecked by a nail gun and he's like, no! Nothing hurt enough for him to be like, oh god! He couldn't do that. He was just like, no! It hurts the exact same! Great directing. Anyway, after killing these people, Chris goes home and decides to sleep it off. His wife wakes Chris up the next morning and gets annoyed at him because she smells how drunk he is and is just giving him the third degree. 
Unbelievable. Chris! Chris! You're hammered. I can smell you from here. 365 days, huh? Then she goes away and sees his Christmas outfit that has a lot of blood on it. What the hell? Yeah, what the hell? That's fresh blood. What What the hell? This dude slept like eight hours ago. That blood is still fresh? Who did, what? Did he kill an elk this morning? What happened, Chris? Chris sees this and instead of talking it out, decides to kill her instead. Uh, again, great one-liner, ho ho ho, and that is how the movie ends. Chris kills everyone, and it's a great Christmas story for the whole family. And speaking of family, his daughter is still alive. Okay, Chris, how, how are you going to explain that to your daughter? You're going to jail for the rest of your life. His, her mom's dead. You just ruined a kid's life, you dirty bitch. And shortly after that, he was seen wandering the streets in this suit, babbling incoherently, and then he wandered right into traffic oh okay so chris died he went into traffic jesus she's got no parents now. she's an orphan now wow what a great end to that story anyway amelia can't find anything in the store and thaddeus notices her ring and is like what is the story behind that so now she ends up telling him a story look at these twists m night chagalamanon isn't it getting a little late oh i have all night my mother left it to me when she died Ever since I was a little girl, she used to tell me I was a miracle. Amelia, a miracle. That's a stretch. <laughs> That's a very big stretch. Amelia, a miracle. You know, it's the same. Rhymes. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> um, Astrid, more like Asterix. Not really. Not Frank, more like Cornucopia. Stop. Just stop. So this is the fourth story, and it takes place around Christmas. I'm assuming that's the holiday, but this story makes absolutely no sense. This is where I checked out of the movie. I was like, bro, as soon as she started telling the story, it got ridiculously stupid. And this story is about how a girl comes to flat with these two people, and it turns out they needed to sacrifice to have a baby. And the baby, and I'm going to spoil it, is Amelia. This is the story of how Amelia came to be. Miss Mulvey? Yes. I'm Anna. We spoke on the phone about the room for rent. Yes, of course. Please come in. I'm so sorry. My name is Lavinia, but you can call me Vinny. My name is Lavinia, but you can call me Vinny. How about love? Who, who picks those as the nicknames? My name is Craig, but you can call me Egg? Really? Thank, thank you. Everyone does. Okay, Vinny. My mother always called me by my full name, too. I was named after my great-grandmother. Holy shit, Vinny, shut the fuck up and show her the room. Her daughter built this place. My grandma Jenny. When was it built? 1908. The first year her crops prospered. Oh, uh, right, her crops are prospering, so she built a house. Got it. She got some fucking mad, mad architectural skill for a crop builder. Jesus Christ, the actual carpenter could never. This is a Christmas movie, but that was a Christmas miracle. She built some houses after crops prospered. Can I have- can I crossbow some props? I'd like some crossbow props. Some prosper crops. Prop crossbow. I mean crop props as well. Can I interest anyone in a candy cane? I'm a little- I'm, I'm a little on edge. Without our crops, we'd have nothing. Wow. Are you a student? No, not yet. I'm just looking for a job right now. The ad said that rent was $50 a month. No, oh, let's not worry about all that just now. $50 a month? Bro, where did this take place? In the 30s? $50 a month? I wish my rent was $50 a month. Damn! You take that off for. Vinny's a good guy. I mean, goal or whatever she is. Vin Diesel over here is a good person. So that night, Anna and the family have dinner with Vinny and her husband, Vino. I'm not sure. And they sort of question yeah. Anna. Anna then notices the ring on Vinny's yeah. finger and asks about it. I like your ring. Thank you. It's very special to me. Why is that? Robert, Anna's looking for a new job. You crazy, crazy bitch. What is wrong with you? What's that ring for? Robert, just completely avoid the question. Make it look as suspicious as possible. This girl is gonna easily leave 
if she notices something's up. Could you act less suspicious, please? Uh, anyway, Robert says that you should visit this dude for work, and that sets off a chain of events. That night, Anna is sleeping, but she can hear something coming from her window, and it turns out they're having a little get together slash seance slash little club meeting at their place, and she sees it. Sorry. I didn't mean to startle you. I was just standing here at night looking at you staring my penis was <laughs> I put it back in don't worry don't worry I was just staring at you I didn't mean to startle you I was just looking at you just wondering where you, where you was I just like to watch people sleep it's what I do for everyone how you doing I heard these voices outside and I saw fire fire Ain't no fire out there that I could see. Maybe you ought to go back to bed. Could either of you two fuckboys be a little less suspicious? Could you not conduct business over there in wide view of someone who you're going to sacrifice later? At least make it look less suspicious, bro. Stop staring at people in the nighttime. That's creepy on every level. Also, is this what you're sleeping in, bro? Jeans and a belt and a button-up? Who's really the crazy person? Why don't, why don't you go to the window and show him, Anna? Robert is like, there's no fire. I can't see no fire. Why don't you go to the place where there was just a fire and be like, it was there. Anna's stupid. Anna's gonna die in this movie, and I don't know if people are gonna feel sorry for her, but I 100% don't, because Anna's a stupid idiot. <laughs> so, if you see someone staring at you at nighttime, if you see people doing some crazy activity, and people are being weird, leave. This movie actually reminds me of another movie. It's another word for leave. Get out! And you'll see why just now. The next morning, Anna goes in to find work and gets interviewed by some dude. And this dude says that his daughter Shelly used to talk but doesn't talk much. But right, something's Shelley? creepy. What? Shelly! What do you think? Don't mind her. She doesn't speak much these days. The f- Shelly looks like she teaches. She's still going to school? I guess it's never too late to learn, but god damn it, is it too late to learn in the sixth grade? She also doesn't look like she knows where the voice is even coming from. Shelly looks like she has been Shelly shocked. She, she's just picking something up. She's not even moving it. Shelly looks like she popped a load of LSD and is just trying to stay on two feet. Anna then notices sure. the shop sure. owner has the same ring that Vinny does. And this does not even concern her because she's a stupid, stupid idiot. But then this happens. Hey Shelly, what is it? You're hurting me. Shelly then jump scares her and is like, oh. <laughs> which, <laughs> which should have scared her more. But Shelly can't talk because her tongue's cut off. Anna finds it weird and then leaves and then goes back home because, and let's say it all together, she's a stupid, stupid idiot. What is wrong with this woman? Now, I just want to say this is like the movie Get Out in that she goes to a place that is foreign and she realizes the people around her all seem to have the same or one common interest. Also, like Get Out, someone tries to help her get out, like in the scene where a picture is taken and the guy's like, GET OUT! Shelly was the get out person. Anna goes home and then tells the two people about what she's experienced and she's been having all these weird things happen to her. And they listen. She then passes out from the tea because presumably it's been poisoned and wakes up to find herself in a warehouse with all the people of the community looking towards her as she is now going to be sacrificed. You're going to help give Robert and I something we've always wanted but never had. Child. Okay, this is just me being me, but I want to know the backstory of the man who has a pickaxe in his hand. Robert has a scythe that is going to be used to uh, <laughs> decapitate the gull, but I don't know what the dude with the pickaxe has a pickaxe. Is he, is he playing Minecraft in real life? Is he digging to the center of the earth? What is he doing? What is Shelly doing there since her tongue got cut off? She doesn't want to be part of this group, but she still wants to be part of this group. What was the point? of the guy giving her the job if she was going to be sacrificed anyway. What is any of this? This this is such a wafer thin plotline that has nothing to do with anything. It very, very poorly references better films. And this one is just, I don't know. To me, this is the worst one. Put her on her knees. <laughs> The night, 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 light, night, nights Provided us with fertile crops and land so that we may prosper Oh yeah, 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 crop prosper, my favorite Oh crop, oh crop prosper lord Hey, uh, 
crop prosper lord can you help me prosper these crops and also prosper my wife's panties because i'm trying to make a baby with her so i'm gonna sacrifice this bitch so my wife my old rusty wife can actually bear a child uh but also thank you for those crops they really prospered last year thanks lord we ask that you grant us this blessing that we have wanted for so long please great goddess accept this sacrifice They then uh, cut her head off and then have a child. Our child will make you proud. And that's the last story she told me before she died. Everyone died. As I said, that was four stories. And I do believe I said five at the start. So where is the fifth story? That's right, you're looking at it. It's Thaddeus and Amelia. The final story ends with them. And you're about to see a big sudden twist. Yet again, M. Night Shyamalabala. Thaddeus sees the ring and he's like, that's a great story, I have to have it for my collection. And she's like, hell nah, bruh. And he's like, ugh, damn. Then he decides, alright, I've got something you really should see. And goes down to get a knife so he can threaten her into giving him a ring. As if that's gonna hold up in court. But, a twist happens. I really think you'll be willing to give up that ring when I show you this. Oh shit! It's Panic at the Disco, baby! They're back! They reunited! Just to kill this dude! Oh man, I wonder how all those people got through the door. This dude should have locked his door, shouldn't he? This is some crazy witchcraft, sorcery type shit. They got a dude in a top hat and a coat. They got a dude with an axe. They got someone with dreadlocks in the back. Wish I knew these characters' backstories, because they all look like a great bunch of characters that I would love to see in a sequel, but I'm never gonna see, because I will never watch a sequel of this. What's, what's, what's going on here? Who are you people? Get out of my shop. <laughs> Get out of my shop. Can you imagine if they were like, oh my, oh, sorry about that, sir. Damn, you didn't have to say it like that. Get out. He tried. He really did try. Kill me for my ring. Like you killed my sister. Your sister? Ophelia. My mother had twins. Oh, another twist. Her mother had twins. And this guy somehow killed one of the twins. I don't know how. I really don't get it, but I... <laughs> The reason that Amelia knows that her sister is in the shop is because she's holding her skull. You know how twins can sense everything? I think it stops at the skull. I think if you see a skull and you know that that's your twin, you have some insane in the membrane. But somehow Amelia's like, this, yep, that's my sister. Yep, nope, yeah, that's her. And decides this is the man she wants to exact revenge on. Not the man who actually killed her sister, the man who bought the skull. Great. And you killed her. For a ring. He didn't kill her for a ring, because if he killed her for a ring, he would have had a ring and then not wanted to buy yours. So that logic is flawed in the whole movie. Just like all the others you've killed for the things in this shop. We've seen what you've done to all these people. Again, flaw flawed logic. He didn't do anything to any of the people. He just bought the stuff off of them. So this is just a shopkeeper who you're now going to kill and then have to face trial. You're going to have to face the charges. I hate this movie so much. You don't understand. It is my duty. How did these people get behind him? He was down and he's like, Would you people get out. Where did those guys come from? There was just a dude behind him the whole time. He didn't recognize a bouncer standing there. Thaddeus, get with the program. Little trick my mother taught me for bringing back someone who was taken too soon. Bitch, why didn't you bring back your mother? She's been dead all this time. You could have brought her back. She taught you this trick. She's like, bro, bring me back. Amelia's like, yeah, yeah, I'll bring my sister back. Thanks, G. <laughs> Come on. Amelia, what is wrong with you? So mean. More like a mean Leo. Naughty Leo. Stupid joke. She then gets uh, a little bit of his blood and then drips it out like syrup. I don't know if he's been having too much honey, but that is very, that looks like diabetes right there, bro. Uh, then the movie, as if it didn't already jump the shark, but, um, yeah, so her twin sister Ophelia wakes up and she's covered in glitter, makeup, and eye contacts, also lipstick. She's also naked, but she has a blonde wig, so I don't know, I guess that was her twin sister, just looks kind of weird. But that's what happens when you bring back someone from the seance. Mother said you wouldn't be quite the same. 
Yeah, but Mother didn't say you're gonna be like a deformed creature, did she? How are you gonna bring this into the world? How are you gonna put this into normal, everyday society? You might as well leave her for dead, honestly. And I brought you a present. <laughs> Ophelia then eats Thaddeus, and that's how the movie ends. <clears throat> so, that's the end of Holiday Hell. This was sort of like Holiday Hell for me. I sort of felt like I've been in Holiday Hell ever since this movie started, and I'm really sad that I watched it. In total, after all the anthologies put together, I would give this movie a solid 2 out of 10. The highlights of the movie was White Eminem. Who the fuck do you think you're talking to like that, huh? The door closing. <gasps> the lock is right there, Kevin! <laughs> I actually thought Thaddeus' acting was pretty good. Get out of my shop. Bull Murray brother, he was good too. Christmas and uh, the lowlights of the film was everything else. I've never seen a holiday movie that was about Christmas murdering and bad stuff happening. I don't know what the sort of market is. I don't know if this is something that people watch with their families on Christmas. But I can tell you one thing for sure. It's more like Merry Cringemas. And I am so glad that you guys watched this with me because I could not get through this again alone. <laughs> that is about all I have to say. Thank you so much. For watching this horrible movie with me. If you want to see more Merry Cringemas videos, all you have to do is hit me up because I actually really like doing this stuff. This was fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Please take care of yourselves and until next time, this is Leo telling you, don't get doors that close both ways. But if you open a door, don't close it and then you can't get in. That's stupid. Just, all right, I'm done.